Hello there and a very warm welcome. In this video, I'm going to share a summary by litcharts.com of what many people believe is one of the most important books of the time which we currently find ourselves living through. The book is Timothy Snyder's On Tyranny, 20 Lessons from the 20th Century, a short and concise bestseller which has received international praise and plaudits for helping bring attention to 20 telltale signs of tyranny and how we can avoid it. Because, as the famous adage states, those who fail to learn from history are doomed to repeat it. Now, you're an intelligent person, nobody needs to be told what to believe. With the information, evidence and ability to evaluate and reason, you will be able to make up your own assessment of how many of these telltale signs you recognise in the unfolding of current events. And that's why I'm sharing this video, to simply help more of us see the signs and to learn from a historical perspective. I hope you find it useful. Now, a quick word about the author. Timothy Snyder is one of the world's leading historians of the 20th century, an expert on Eastern Europe and on the Second World War. He's written and edited a number of acclaimed and prize-winning books about 20th century European history. He's the Levin Professor of History at Yale University in America and a frequent contributor to newspapers and journals around the world. Okay, before we jump into the summary of the 20 lessons, let's just read the overview of the book. The Founding Fathers tried to protect us from the threat they knew, the tyranny that overcame ancient democracy. Today, our political order faces new threats, not unlike the totalitarianism of the 20th century. We are no wiser than the Europeans who saw democracy yield to fascism, Nazism or communism. Our one advantage is that we might learn from their perspective. In On Tyranny, a short guide to 20 different strategies that citizens can use to defend democracy against an authoritarian government, historian Timothy Snyder looks to 20th century Europe in an effort to help 21st century citizens cope with current events. In his prologue, Snyder notes that democratic regimes have always fallen to tyranny ever since the very concepts of democracy and tyranny were invented in ancient Greece. And while most of us tend to assume that democracy is inherently stable and our government institutions are strong enough to withstand anti-democratic attacks, this is not true. In fact, people throughout history have made this same mistake, wrongly assuming that their democracies will survive, only to watch authoritarian governments destroy them in as little as a few years and set their nations on a path toward ruin, and in extreme cases, horrific campaigns of violence like the Holocaust. Snyder argues that democracy now faces the same threat of collapse and he offers 20 ways to help preserve it. So, some of the different methods we're going to look at include, in this order, symbols, language and ethics, military force, psychological and rhetorical strategies, how citizens can preserve freedom in their everyday lives, and how governments stop doing it in private and try to crumple democracy all at once. So, Snyder's first rule is do not obey in advance. Throughout history, not only have significant portions of the public generally supported tyrants like Adolf Hitler, but most of the rest of the population has simply put their personal disagreements aside and reluctantly obeyed the government. This is essentially the worst thing people can do because tyranny functions by winning obedience and then implementing oppressive and anti-democratic policies that harm the same people who are passively obeying. Secondly, Snyder implores readers to defend institutions. Institutions are only as strong as the people who make them up, and authoritarians always try to dismantle democratic institutions in order to avoid checks and balances on their power. On a similar note, Snyder's third rule is beware the one-party state. An effective multi-party system ensures that no one group will be able to completely turn the state into a machine for advancing their own private interests. Fourthly, Snyder asks citizens to take responsibility for the face of the world. Specifically, he means they must refuse to display the signs of hate, exclusion and loyalty that tyrants and their supporters ask them to put up. These symbols of obedience, like swastikas and gold stars in Nazi Germany, or pro-government propaganda signs in communist Eastern Europe, allow tyrants to bring their agendas even into people's private lives. So a personal note, contemplate what signs or symbols have you been told to adopt? 
Next, Snyder implores his readers to remember professional ethics when the government starts claiming that they no longer apply. He points out that when the Nazi government demanded obedience, doctors, lawyers and businessmen all made an exception and put their usual ethical obligations aside, and as a result they ended up directly participating in the Holocaust. When the government asks people to put professional ethics aside, they must do the opposite. These moral commitments are unwavering and uncompromisable, and they must be put first. So another personal note, are any people in positions of trust and power blindly following diktats and orders which go against professional ethics? Snyder's sixth and seventh rules concern the use of military force. In the 6th he tells readers to be very wary of paramilitaries, like secret police forces and death squads which tyrants use for their own private ends. And in the 7th chapter Snyder asks readers to be reflective if you must be armed. The Nazis and Soviets roped normal police officers and soldiers into their mass murder campaigns and these individuals willingly chose to participate despite knowing that they were being asked to attack the same populace that it was their job to defend. Another personal note who are those in security positions and in the police force there to protect and defend. In the 8th chapter, Snyder insists that readers must stand out. Just like Winston Churchill gave the Allies the upper hand in World War II by defending Britain against Hitler, and a Polish teenager named Teresa Plekarawa refused to abandon her Jewish friends when the Nazis ordered them into the Warsaw Ghetto. Contemporary people can also provide a counterexample to the status quo and help remind others of the moral principles and obligations that tyrants are asking them to abandon. In the next three chapters, Snyder starts looking at the rhetorical and psychological strategies that authoritarian governments, and particularly extreme totalitarian ones, use to repress dissent and control the populace. So in chapter 9 he tells readers to be kind to our language. Why tyrants strategically change the meaning of words like the people in order to make citizens think that everyone agrees with and will benefit from their policies, citizens must remember that these words have real meanings and refuse to join everyone else's collective trance. Rather than simply watching the nightly news, contemporary citizens must read books in order to refine their capacities for analysis and build a mental armory of ideas about politics and history. Another personal note, are you or anyone that you know caught up in the collective trance through being spoon-fed the mainstream media? And whose interests and agenda is that really serving? In chapter 10, Snyder argues that it's essential to believe in truth. In order to support the truth, Snyder asks readers to investigate. So personal note, why are so many professionals who are investigating what we are being told to believe being censored, silenced or attacked? In chapter 11, specifically, they must fact check what they read online and try to support high quality investigative journalism rather than simply sticking to opinion writers who are already on their side. In the next four chapters, Snyder shows how citizens can preserve freedom in their everyday lives. First, they must simply make eye contact and small talk in order to remind their neighbours that they will not let politics invade and destroy their private sphere. So another personal note, what are we being told we can't and shouldn't do right now and who we can, can't, see and speak to? 13. Next they should practice corporeal politics and actively protest together in the streets rather than sitting at home and simply hoping that the government will change. So another personal note, look at all of the infringements and restrictions put in place against people questioning the narrative. 14. Citizens must establish a private life, most of all by guarding their digital privacy in order to set a line that government cannot cross and ensure that future authoritarians cannot use their data against them. So another personal note, take a close look at the updated terms and conditions, ever increasing censorship and infringement of privacy across the internet and social platforms. 15. Citizens should contribute to good causes by dedicating both time and money to supporting organisations that matter to them. This allows citizens to both specifically fight oppressive policies and exercise their freedom of association to sustain civil liberty or the sphere of collective life that is separate from formal government control. In his 16th chapter, Snyder asks his readers to look outward to the rest of the world and learn from peers in other countries. 
So in the last four chapters, Snyder warns citizens about a key turning point on the road from freedom to tyranny. At a certain point, authoritarians stop gradually accumulating power in the background and instead start taking huge steps to topple democracy all at once. So another personal note, simply take a look at what is happening right now across the world and the clearly stated and pre-planned coordinated international push for a global restructure. It's in plain sight and it's pre-written. In chapter 17, Listen for Dangerous Words, he points out how the Nazis and other tyrannous governments have used propaganda words like extremism, terrorism, emergency and exception to suspend the rights and freedoms that allow democracy to function. In the face of a terrorist attack or other national emergency, for example, they will declare that all citizens must give up their rights for the sake of the nation as a whole. But this is usually a trap and authoritarians usually never give these rights back even long after the emergency has passed. So personal note, you can use your own eyes and see what's going on right now. What rights have you been forced to give up? In chapter 18, Snyder looks at the most famous example of such a power grab, the mysterious fire at the Reichstag, Germany's parliament, a month after Hitler came to power. Hitler declared a national emergency, started suspending citizens' rights and jailing his opponents, and then convinced the parliament to give him absolute dictatorial power. He never gave any of these powers up. Ultimately, the fire, which historians think the Nazis probably set, gave Hitler a pretext for completely dismantling German democracy in a matter of days. Vladimir Putin used a similar tactic several times in the late 1990s and early 2000s, exploiting terrorist attacks launched by his own secret police in order to destroy institutions and opposition groups. In chapter 19, Snyder argues that people should try to be a patriot, to remember what is really in the national interest, the preservation of democracy, and refuse to let government convince them that whatever they want for themselves is best for the country as a whole. And in 20, patriotism can even mean self-sacrifice. In this brief final chapter, Snyder tells citizens to be as courageous as you can, because if none of us is prepared to die for freedom, then all of us will die under tyranny. In his epilogue, Snyder warns against two political tendencies that he calls the politics of inevitability and the politics of eternity. Ignorant of the past, many simply assume that history is consistent progress and democracy will never fail them. This is the politics of inevitability. Recognising that things seem to be getting worse, others start fixating on an idealised past that never existed. For example, Trump exemplifying with the slogan, Make America Great Again. But both of these ideologies rely on a misunderstanding of the past and a mistaken assumption that the future is already determined and outside citizens' control. In reality, Snyder concludes people's political choices do have the power to shape the future and people must step up to defend their democracy unless they want to see it disappear. So there you have it, a short summary of On Tyranny by Tim Snyder. I hope you found this useful and got some food for thought from this video. We are living through critical times and we need to be able to learn from our past so that we don't repeat it. Are we going to tell our grandchildren that we stood up for them when we sensed that things weren't right and we saw the evidence to prove it? Or will we ignore the obvious signs and do nothing? Those in powers are there to serve the populace. Do not let them become tyrants. Full credit and thanks to Rohan Jennings' summary this is taken from on litcharts.com. Wishing you and yours much health and happiness. Thank you for your time. Please feel free to share this video.